I'm Larry O'Connor alongside Brian Wilson. Joining us now on the line is Joe DeGenova, our legal analyst. And what better day to have Joe? I can't think of a better day because we, we've got a, a ruling from a, 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 a judge that says that the, the gun laws in the District of Columbia that say you cannot carry a gun outside your home have been ruled in a pretty strongly stated uh, ruling that it's unconstitutional, that you cannot ban people from pairing guns in the in the District of Columbia. Joe DeGeneva is on the line. Joe, yes. so can, should should the people who live, let's say, in Virginia or Maryland, or if you have a legally registered gun, a gun in the District of Columbia, I, I guess there's nothing that would stop you from packing heat today. Well, the judge issued an injunction against the enforcement of the D.C. law, ordering the police chief, the mayor, and anyone who has any responsibilities under it to cease and desist, uh, and declared the law unconstitutional and unenforceable. So as of uh, yesterday, as of Saturday, uh, you can carry in the district either as a district resident or from anywhere in the United States. I wouldn't advise anybody to do it and become a test case, yeah. but the truth is that's the law. And until the District of Columbia appeals that ruling or gets a stay of its enforcement, the law is you can carry now, even though um, all the laws in the district say you can't. There's an interesting history to all that, but it doesn't matter now. Okay, so as I understand it, the Washington Post is reporting that uh, Kathy Lanier, the police chief, told her officers, look, if you encounter somebody who's carrying, you are not to arrest them. Yeah, but well, but, that's, but that's, there's going to be the injunction. She doesn't have any choice. So, but there's going to be an attempt to get a stay of this law right. while they appeal it, right? Right. Yes, I assume that the district will do that. They they are, as you know, the politicians in the district are all very anti-gun, except for criminals. They don't do anything to stop criminals from getting guns, but they're against law-abiding citizens having guns. And they have done everything in their power to prevent them from having them even in their homes. And it wasn't until the Supreme Court told them they had to cease and desist from that that they did that. By the way, you used to be able to get a gun, carry a gun in the District of Columbia, but the district would never issue a license for it. So after Heller came down in 2008, the District of Columbia repealed the law that allowed you to carry a pistol without a license, creating no carry in the District of Columbia after Heller. That shows you how outrageously anti the Supreme Court, the District of Columbia people were. They took away a right that had been on the books, even though they weren't giving you a license to carry it. It existed technically, the right to carry. They took it away after Heller. So as the former uh, U.S. attorney here in the district, uh, when you get a, 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 a decision handed down like this over the weekend, what kind of mobilization effort do you have for the attorneys that work for you here in the district? Well, what because you do is you, you have people that are always assigned to these cases, there was somebody representing the District of Columbia in this case, which has been around for five years. They will now consult with the, the Attorney General for the District of Columbia and probably the mayor, uh, and they'll file a stay probably in all likelihood within the next uh, day or two, uh, you know, and they'll wait and they'll see if he grants it. He may not grant it because it's a constitutional right, and uh, which he says is now completely enforceable, and they may have to go to the D.C. Circuit to get a stay pending their appeal. Well, I mean, the, word, the, the language is really strongly written by this judge, Judge Scullins. He says, it enjoins the defendants from enforcing the home limitations of D.C. firearm laws unless and until such time as the District of Columbia adopts a licensing mechanism consistent with constitutional standards. Right. The, it sounds like this judge has got his mind made up. Well, <laughs> he not only has it made up, he wrote it down and issued it. Uh, I was a U.S. attorney with Fred Scullin. We were both appointed by President Reagan. He was the U.S. attorney in Syracuse, and then he became a federal judge back in the 1980s, and he's been sitting ever since. He's now a senior judge in Syracuse, and he was sitting by designation down here. They, judges frequently sit all over the country to help with backlogs, and that's what he was doing here. This, this, this ruling is complete and unalterable. It says that the onerous restrictions on registration that the district adopted after Heller are completely inconsistent with the Heller ruling and are designed purposely to prevent people from owning guns even in their homes and taking them and carrying them. So he says, and a bunch of other federal appellate courts agree with him, that the right to own a gun and have it includes in the Second Amendment the right to carry it. If you can't carry it, you can't defend yourself. So you and remember, in the district, your gun, when you no, don't have it in your hand in your house to defend yourself, has to be under lock and key, needs a trigger lock, can't be accessible, which means that its value as a weapon of self-defense is utterly useless. 
Uh, let's uh, focus, if we can, Joe DeGeneva, on the other big local story, and that is the trial of former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell and his wife Maureen. The jury selection actually begins today in that corruption trial, and uh, it's interesting, but he's certainly getting swift justice and getting a speedy trial. Uh, this thing's moving along at a pretty tidy clip, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, this is they're going to go to tr- they always go to trial pretty fast in the eastern district of virginia which is as you know historically called the rocket docket this this trial is going to be about character the 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 governor and his wife have uh, given a list of character witnesses that they intend to call and the judge is going to allow them to call a fairly large number for each of them in this case um, it's an ugly case it's a case full of all sorts of ugly things and uh, personal shortcomings by the governor and his wife what I don't personally believe that there were crimes committed. I think they've stretched the federal law. The prosecutors over there have stretched the federal law beyond its natural and proper meaning. But, you know, that's what they're allowed to do. Well, and because of that, and because they've stretched this, it, it, is, is it fair, and it, obviously he's going to have his day in court, and we'll wait until to see what the decision, uh, if, uh, how the decision comes down from the jury. But if he is acquitted on this, is it fair to say that the, uh, the, the U.S. attorney here was more politically motivated than actually uh, uh, worrying about the laws of the land with regard well, I, to political I, you corruption? Know, it, it's easy to say that, but I don't think so. I, I, I think what's probably more so that this was overactive federal enforcement, uh, people trying to show that they're, you know, they can do anything, even if especially if it's a governor. Uh, I, I think the governor and his wife provided the U.S. attorney with ample reason to investigate yeah, by the way yeah. they conducted their personal and political lives. I think they did some very stupid things, some things which invited scrutiny, but I don't think any of it violates federal law. In fact, we know as a matter of law that it did not violate state law. Well, I mean, I... They've been cleared by the Ethics Commission and by the state attorney general, by the local county attorneys. So the reason the feds are pursuing this escapes me. I'm not going to accuse the U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of being political, but the reason for pursuing this is pretty shaky. Well, I've heard that the the, the, the sort of the backup plan is if they can't get a conviction on on the things that that you've listed there, that they still have one count in which uh, they apparently did not... Uh, spell all this out in a banking document of some kind. That, that's correct. They, they're allegedly they're alleging bank fraud where they failed to disclose certain loans and other things. Um, uh, th- that's actually not a very good case because that happens all the time with people applying for loans. There are things that aren't put on the loan application. Uh, we're all familiar with that, and most of the people in the jury are familiar with bank loan applications. They know how goofy and extreme they are, and they've also, all of them have probably forgotten something on a loan application. All right, Joe DeGeneva, always good to have you, especially on a day like yeah, this. Thanks and, uh, a lot, Joe. We'll, we'll, we'll be uh, excited to see Joe uh, walking around Washington yeah, with his uh, pack and heat firearm I have there. My Beretta with me today, which, by the way, as you know, uh, the Beretta is leaving Maryland. Thanks to Mike Miller and all the clowns in the state legislature. That's right. All right. Well, make sure you uh, tweet out a selfie of you. With yeah, your, I want. Uh, I want to uh, see uh, you packing, openly heat. carrying your Beretta. That's right. Right at my law office in D.C. <laughs>